Hey, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to be doing all things DME tonight. Very exciting. Um, hey, it's exciting to us. Uh, we're, we do this on a daily basis. So, um, uh, we call it the business of DME. I'm your host, uh, Michael McBrayer. I'm senior vice president at DJO. I've uh, been with the organization for, for 33 years and, uh, and looking forward to this. Um, I'm going to be joined by the experts, uh, Natasha Yustaf and Nick Cannon, and thank goodness uh, that they're here because uh, you wouldn't want me to be trying to walk through uh, all this educational material. Um, really the goal um, uh, is an opportunity for you guys to have some alternatives when you're looking at your DME um, and giving the opportunity to have the right products at the right price and you know the, the billing of it and all those complicated features that go into DME. We wanna at least educate you guys enough tonight um, to be educated to make questions and to decide whether or not you have the right program at your site, uh, whether you wanna change that program and, and really give some insights because there's been some changes for Medicare patients with competitive bidding, um, being able to do, you know, their deductibles are, are larger now. How do you take care of deductibles? Um, and, and the coding of these products are, are not necessarily easy and, and, and well understood. It, it is confusing. So hopefully we, we do a good job of, of really putting that together. I want to thank AMSSM, um, you know, for putting this together as well. Uh, also in the email blast of getting a picture of me from like the 1980s. Um, so if you're looking at that picture from your email blast and you're wondering where Michael McBrayer is, this is me today. So just eliminate that younger picture of me um, or keep it. And uh, at least I can look at it uh, and remember things from that. Um, we do as a mission for DJO, we're, we, we believe in power in motion. Um, the, um, oh yeah, thanks, Jim Griffith. Jim just throws in, he says, I haven't changed a bit, by the way. So he's, he's already commenting on this. Um, power in motion is actually a, an ability to partner with you, the clinician, and, and helping these patients uh, keep in motion. And we do know that motion is medicine. Um, getting people out and getting them doing things uh, keeps them away from the comorbidities and all the other issues, uh, their weight, uh, we all know the benefit of motion and, and our products uh, and BME products actually absolutely help in that realm. And, and so we're, we'll continue to keep that partnership with you guys, the clinicians, and, uh, and keeping people moving. Natasha? So just a little bit of uh, background on DJO, uh, if you don't know us. Um, DJO is a Colfax uh, company today. Colfax is a public company on the New York Stock Exchange. So you can garner, you know, garner a lot of information just because of our public entity. Um, DJO uh, was acquired by uh, Colfax uh, effectively just a couple of years ago. Um, we have most recently announced that we will be separating uh, the, the two entities of Colfax, uh, their kind of industrial business and DJO being the medical business into two uh, public companies. So that'll happen about sometime next year. Um, but I started with the company that long ago. Um, Don Joy was the original piece that started DJO. And, and there's a great story uh, around uh, why Don Joy and where, where that came from. Um, I played basketball in a league um, with two individuals. Uh, one was Mark Norquist. He was the offensive line captain for the Philadelphia Eagles and a very fine basketball player, by the way, and Ken Reed. We played in the Boys and Girls Club League in Carlsbad, California. Well, one year, uh, Mark Nordquist came back from his NFL year, and he had inner tube rubber on his elbows and his knees. And he was saying how well that helped his knees and his elbows you know, during, during the season. Well, there happened to be another company in, in Carlsbad, and that company was Body Glove um, and Wetsuits. So they decided that that material was a lot nicer than inner tube rubber. Um, and they literally started cutting up wetsuits uh, to make knee sleeves and elbow sleeves. Um, decided it was a good enough idea to create a company out of it. And they leveraged their homes to get some cash to create the company. Well, in order to get their wives to sign on these new loans, they named the company after them. 
So Donna Reed and Joy Norquist. So that's where Don Joy came from. Um, that company went from this garage based neoprene company to now being a part of the entire DJO program, if you will, uh, total joints, um, bone growth simulation, uh, brands that you're aware of as Aircast, Donjoy, and ProCare. Um, we really have everything from trying to prevent injury to post-injury to operative and post-operative care. Um, so we're a unique orthopedic company. And we're the seventh largest orthopedic company in the world, but very, very different from the, the big ones of Stryker and J&J &J and people like that because they really focus on just the operative side of putting metal and plastic in people. And, and we certainly try to push that out much further um, than, than trying to, um, you know, just, just do the operative side. But at this point in time, I am going to hand it over to, um, like I said, the experts in this. We're, we'll get you acquainted with all the different things in, in the DME world. And uh, I'd like to hand it over to Natasha. Natasha, take over for me, please. I will do so. Thank you so much. So before I do so, I just wanted to say some housekeeping things. If you have any questions that come up during our presentation, please feel free to use the chat function on the side. I will get to those at the end. And then if you'd prefer to ask one live, feel free to unmute yourself at the end. We'll make sure we save some time um, to answer and address as many as we possibly can. So on that note, Michael shared a little bit about the history of DJO and how we got to where we are today. Um, and as Nick and I spent some time kind of diving deeper into what the topics we chose, I'd like for you to ask yourselves a question. And it's really about how do you know DJO? The question first and foremost is, do I know who DJO is? If you answer that question, yes, then your follow-up question should be, am I utilizing that business relationship to its capabilities or to its full potential? If the answer is no, then that I would really like to have you ask yourself, were you aware of who DJO is? And oftentimes that answer is no. Oftentimes people don't recognize our brand equity, but it's important to note that when you're looking at all these pro athletes on TV, whether it be collegiate or NFL or whatever, they're typically sporting a DJ, a Dodroy brace. We are, as far as Stockenbills are concerned, in 33 out of the 5,000 clinics across the country. That's a pretty large footprint. We are the only company that span all three sides of the pre, post, and perioperative care. We have MotionMD, and sometimes people aren't aware of that. That's our own proprietary software that we use to create a proof of delivery ticket and manage your inventory. Oftentimes, people don't know that that falls under our umbrella. So with regard to everything that we're saying today, keep those things in mind and ultimately understand that there are multitudes of ways that you can use a business relationship with DJO. So DJO is unique in the sense that they have a business unit really dedicated to what I call the economics of DME. So it's healthcare solutions where both Nick and I um, belong. And really what we do is work, work with accounts and providers such as yourselves to really navigate that DME space in a, a facet of different ways. So whether that be expert consulting, whether that be to really realize where we can do some reimbursement best practices, we can do some workflow optimization. Maybe you want to take the paper component out of a transaction. That's where you would come to us for. We customize DME solutions to fit your needs. If I've got 31 participants on the call right now, I can guarantee you I'm going to make 31 different customized solutions because not all of you operate the same way. So it's important to understand that when you work with DJO, although we are the leading, like Michael said, we are the seventh largest orthopedic company, the only one that does it primarily outside of the body, we have an entire business unit that really goes really so far beyond the sale of the widget. The, we don't, the business relationship doesn't stop there. We really want to exceed that and make you understand, okay, now that we've sold you this product, how can it best serve you? And that's where our team comes into play. So we took a, spe a step back to really understand the sports medicine marketplace. And I think to figure out where you want to go, you first have to know where you are. So the current market size in sports medicine is approximately $8.7 billion. The most interesting note here is the revenue forecast in 2027, so that's less than six years, is going to be $15.2 billion. That's tremendous. And that's a really big trajectory. So as you're listening to everything that we say today, ask yourself, do I have the, the, the plan in place to support moving at that rate of speed? The knee application segment dominated in the sports medicine market in 2019. 
I was really interested to find a study done in February of 2020 that named DJO as a key company in sports medicine. We were noted as constantly upgrading our, our, our market share and our product portfolio to really meet the needs of the sports medicine market. So understand that when you partner with DJO, you're partnering with somebody that not only understands where you are, but understands where you need to be and will help you get there in lockstep. So what we're going to focus on today are four tools, four tools that Nick and I thought were probably the most impactful at making a critical choice in your DME program. The first one is going to be analytics, really creating a data driven approach. The next one's going to be protocols. We say it all the time, but it's not used often enough is really creating continuity of care by creating protocols and addressing your patient care in that capacity. Nick is going to touch on automation. How do you take the paper component out of transacting? That's probably, you know, business 101. And then patient experience and patient as the new payer. This is a topic of conversation that is really a hot topic in the market right now. It's something that we're all getting graded on. So how can we get better at that and get better together? And we'll go through that. So first, we're going to talk about analytics. In its simplest manner, data is power. So how can we get educated decisions based on factual data instead of hypothetical data? You know, it, the first, first and foremost is making sure that all of your data is organized and centrally located. I hear so often, yes, I would love to make educated decisions based on numbers. I just don't know how to find the numbers. Well, it's important to have something in place that gets you those numbers and lets you understand how to utilize them for your own practice. All of this creates ease of use and accessibility. And I think one of the things or a common thread that you'll hear today between both Nick and myself is really an organized approach at creating a, um, a business workflow, whether that be through analytics or through protocols or through um, you know, patient engagement. It's getting all of that information in one central location and then having it work for you. So when we talk about graphics and, and practice metrics, some of the ones that you may want to notably look at are physician prescribing habits. How are physicians stacking up against each other when it comes to your clinic? Do you have some that are um, not prescribing as much or maybe offloading some of those prescriptions to an outside vendor? Is that things that you can circumvent and then you know, create a revenue generation opportunity out of it? Another thing to look at is product optimization. Can you do some skew rationalization? Is there a situation where maybe you have many products with the same HICPIC code, but multiple vendors? That would create a scenario where you can minimize SKUs, minimize vendors, and again, organize everything on your shelves. Again, that organizational approach is gonna be something that you hear often in what I say and probably what Nick says also. So along those lines and kind of on the topic of organization is really the protocols. So that's the second point that we really wanted to talk about. And when we talk about protocols, it's really figuring out how can you organize and streamline the way you approach patient care. It will allow you to really create a methodical approach or a roadmap to your practice. So again, everything that you notice all ties into one another. The creation of protocols typically stems from your historical data. How have I treated this indication in the past? What changes have I made from point A to point B? Why or how did those changes arise? When you understand that, then you can create a protocol that's in line with the approach to a specific diagnosis. This creates a formulary. And again, it drives a, a habit. It drives a more streamlined and consolidated approach, eliminating the need to overthink something or to possibly miss out on something. So that's why protocols are so important. You choose products, you align it with the diagnosis, and then you can add optional exercises or notes. So what you see on the screen is an example of an upper extremity protocol. Let's say historically you've always used an ultra sling pro for your shoulder protocols. And somebody brought to your attention that maybe you want to consider using a clear cube. So we did this formula for you. If you were to see 40 patients a month and you added the clear cube, would that equate to possibly an extra $5,000 of net income? All these things that you want to think about when you're creating these protocols, driving a better patient experience, and also realizing that it's going to affect your bottom line positively. Again, all of this information is driving your habits, driving your decision making, because again, it's all about information and data. Hey, Natasha. Again, once, what, I, was yes. just gonna, I was just going to interject, and because and you said it, and it, it is important. It's the it's this patient experience. So. You know, if, if you have a patient that uh, has, you know, sitting in the waiting room 
and they had the same exact, you know, injury, so to speak, and they get talking, but they have two different products. It's like, well, why did you get that one? And why did I get that one? And so, you know, it's this idea that you take this kind of systematic approach to, to, to the disease states. And, and I think that um, it really does drive this patient experience that um, is and the outcomes. So I, I just, I really like pointing that out that it's, it's really patient driven uh, more than anything. Absolutely. I mean, the patient's at the forefront of everything that we do. You want to make sure, you know, I and Michael can attest to this and probably Nick can too, is you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And back in the day where we really hoped we had a great patient outcome, but we weren't necessarily being graded on it. Well, times have changed. And now the patient has a voice and probably a louder voice than they've ever had before. So we want to make sure that we're taking that into consideration and doing everything that we can to really enhance and grow that patient experience. So Along those lines, I can almost hear somebody on the phone saying, yeah, that sounds great. Protocols, data, phenomenal. How am I going to get to it? <laughs> well, that's where I'm going to hand it off to Nick. So Nick is going to talk about our proprietary software and how not only can it do the first two points that I mentioned, but he's going to go through some other features and benefits of MotionMD that can align all of this information, gather it for you so it's centrally located, and then in line with our business unit can manipulate the information to get you the inform to get you the data that you need to make your educated decisions whether that be offsetting dme bringing some more on skew rationalization business protocols whatever the case may be you'll be able to do that all through here so nick i'll hand it to you awesome guys thank you uh thank you for joining us tonight uh live and thank you for those that are joining us uh, to, to the recorded content later I have neither the hair or the energy that Natasha and Michael have, but I'll do my best to uh, fulfill the, the last part of this segment here from us at, at DJO. Um, yeah, hey, so Nick, I've got the- Before you get started, I, yeah. I did get a haircut. So you, everybody on this, uh, my COVID hair is gone. So they, they missed out on that. So They, they did, <laughs> but for those participants viewing right now, and specifically those that know Michael McBrayer, if you know him, uh, let me know, because I've taken screenshots. I can, I can send you pictures of his COVID hair. It's pretty <laughs> no, but um, no, thank you anyways. And I've got two topics to talk to you guys about. Natasha alluded to them earlier on one of the slides, but I want to talk to you about automation, and I want to talk to you about um, the patient experience and patient is the new payer. I, I do think that the two things go together. Uh, so hopefully that's conveyed in the message in, in the next few slides, but uh, we'll start off with automation. So the whole purpose of this presentation today is to talk about helping you run the business of DME. And you guys are leveraging technology today in your practice management softwares, your, your EMRs, billing softwares. There's, there's a number of different things that you're using and, and touching every day. It helps you run the business of orthopedics, but specifically for the context of DME, I want to talk to you about automating D the DME practice um, and leveraging technology to, to optimize any performance goals that you have. I would think by any measure of uh, success that you would want to have a profitable, compliant program that is patient-friendly, staff-friendly, convenient for yourself as a provider um, that gives you back time to be well spent with patients and gives you peace of mind that the program is moving, you know, in, in a way that's, that's going to be productive for everybody included. So uh, we have developed a software called MotionMD, um, and that's my best perspective to talk to you guys about automation today. Um, so it'll be in that context that we'll describe what it is that that does. But generally speaking, it's just critical that, that you're using technology to, to make things easier on yourself and running this business. So Quick overview here, um, there's, there's four sort of buckets on the slide that you're looking at. But in general, today when you recognize a need for a patient that they need a brace or, or some sort of DME supporting device, um, you know, someone is acknowledged, you know, someone finds out that they need to go grab a patient, grab a product, teach them how to use that product, collect some information, turn the room and go about their merry way. Um, this software that we've developed, we developed for ourselves because we have the same concern. You know, there's the business of, that we have at DJO of, of pro providing our, our product. We also have this licensed software that we're talking about today. But um, you may also know that we have an outsourced billing service. So for providers that 
that aren't looking to DME as an ancillary revenue opportunity, they also have the opportunity to, um, to use an outsource provider like DJO for what is called a stock and bill program or a consignment program. And we have over 3,000 locations where we're billing DME at our provider locations that we're partnered with. And in that, we had a massive issue. Like we needed to figure out how to manage inventory properly, how to aggregate the data necessary to bill insurance to run a, a profitable and compliant program in a way that was scalable and that could be used over time as we grew. And so any issues that providers face, you know, whether it's, you know, a, a single, uh, single person practice or 20, pra 20 man practice or, you know, a hundred, we wanted to be able to have a solution that worked for us, that worked for our commercial providers, that allowed them to scale as they grew and to allow them to streamline some some necessary steps in the process of managing DME that they encountered. So the first and primary thing that we do is take you away from paper. And, and so I know that that's prevalent in all the things that you're trying to accomplish in an orthopedic practice. We're getting you away from a process today that is arduous, time consuming, where you're using a super bill or some sort of you know proprietary document that you've created for your practice to aggregate the debt data necessary to bill insurance as you're dispensing the product to the patient. So today with Motion MB, you're able to dispense that product to the patient, whether it's MA, PA, tech, or otherwise, and quickly and easily identify the information necessary to bill and have that be in one place so that anyone who has responsibility over a DME program, DME coordinator, billing personnel, the clinical staff that's dispensing to the product, has access to the information that they need to complete the life cycle of that transaction to the patient and ultimately for you to be able to bill for it through the patient through insurance. So that's the first thing is getting away from paper, bringing it to the cloud, making that data secure, efficient and accessible to everyone to make actionable decision making in your DME program. The second thing as a slide will show too is, is claims management and it goes along with what I was talking about. So, you know, like I said, in any measure of performance of a DME program, one of those aspects is going to be profitability. Like, are you are you managing in such a way that you're um, that you're collecting the revenue due to you, and that you're you're managing costs, etc. You want to bill fast, quick, and get paid in the same manner, right? So, our clean claim technology allows you and your staff, particularly who's dispensing the product to the patient, to get that in one single quick process it takes less than a minute so that you're able to bill insurance and get paid in a quick format so when you when you're looking at automation when you're looking at leveraging technology that's a huge component to it the other thing that happens when you're using motion d is you're managing inventory and it's not an inventory tool just for dme but you can use it for all manner of supplies and pharmaceuticals anything that you want to keep track of but it allows you to know what you have where you have it and manage inventory in such a way so that you're never in a position where you don't have what you need when you need it with a patient, but you're also not holding so much inventory that you're tying up your critical clash, clash flow, cash flow um, that could be used for other aspects of your business. So really just you know, creating clean metrics to manage your inventory. And then finally, I'm sorry. I think that's someone or not on mute. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is throughout the whole process, you know, again, we said that one of the measures of success would be the experience that the patient has. Um, how are you addressing that? And, and is that something that, that you're optimizing to its, its greatest, you know, uh, perspective? And through MotionMD, we've got some technology that not only provides um, really clear communication where when the patient signs off for the product that they're receiving, they will be able to receive an email version of the transaction. We call it a patient agreement that includes information on the product that they received, the, um, the, the, the responsibility that they have financially for that product. So like an actual receipt at that time that they're receiving it. But it also, particularly if it is a DJO product, would include a link to the product so that they can learn how to don and dot the product after they've left your clinic. So it's, 
it's a touch point to that patient um, that creates a better patient experience. Um, and as the slide now suggests, um, there's a quick image here that shows you what that patient would actually receive. So everybody today has got a smartphone. They got an iPhone or an Android or something, right? And so if they accept the opportunity to receive a patient agreement directly to their email, they're going to get it right there in clinic. If they've got their sound on, you know, it's a click ping and they'll have it right then and there. So it gives them a lot of confidence that they know what they're getting because as I said, they're going to, they're going to have, um, financial information on that. They're going to know exactly what they owe for it and understand what they've just received. And that's, that's a good okay. tie into the next component of what we've deemed is, is really critical in managing a, a DME program here. So. Hey, Nick, just to, yeah. to butt in here real quick, there was a, you know, cause you, you talk about the patient experience and the payment. There was a question in the chat of just, you know, options for self pay. Well, let's take a look. I, I'm trying to pull it up myself. So you can just, you know, kind of describe, you know, so that, you know, when they understand their deductible, you know, at least, you know, the self-pay portion of what they're going to have is, you know, they can have some confidence related to what they, they actually owe, I think, is, is what they're potentially asking for options. Oh, got it. Now, now I'm taking a look. Go ahead, Natasha. Yeah, so I don't necessarily see the question about the the um, cash pay, but there's definitely ways to load cash pay items within MotionMD so you can navigate knowing there's also ways and, and um, descriptors within product. There are product specific that'll tell you which ones are eligible for insurance and which ones aren't. And if they are eligible for insurance, which codes you should bill. And if it's a cash pay, it'll tell you what the cash pay price is. If that helps, there was also another question, and I know we said we we're going to leave this to the end, but I might as well talk about it now, um, about DGO product specific to pediatrics. So we do have a pediatrics line, um, but I think it's important to note pediatric product or not, they're still following the same guidelines when it comes to billing DME. Um, so, you know, they're definitely a lot of the things that we've already stated would be relevant in that market space as well. But to answer your question, absolutely. So at the very end, we'll have both uh, Mick Cannon and my contact information. And so please feel free to reach out to us on our email and we can get you a full download of products or ask any other questions that require more details. So sorry, Nick. No, 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 perfect. Um, and I was looking at that the pediatric question. Thank you for sending it, first of all. But from a product standpoint, that's certainly something we can get in contact with you and, and provide you as much information as you need for that. Um, but going back to you know the business of DME, you, you obviously establish the need for automation and having access to data that gives you the ability to make you know informed decisions, right? Um, the patient responsibility and, and the patient experience is, is incredibly critical to a successful program as well. And we've addressed that in many ways within our MotionMD software. Um, but I want to give some facts to just make you recognize the, the financial impact of, of patient responsibility today. So if you're looking at this slide, um, the pie graph shows, you know, total bill charges in a DMA program and where the opportunity from a collection standpoint is gonna to have to come from in order to be successful. So 67% of that is coming from the payer, 33% is coming from the patient. Historically, many years ago, although it's taken a while, I think, for uh, the business of healthcare to recognize it, um, a much larger portion of that responsibility was on the onus of the payer. And you know you could you could collect from the patient, but if you weren't very successful in that, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, in modern times, with the uh, the present you know high deductible um, epidemic's the wrong word. Somebody help me here. But uh, with the the presence of high deductible plans, the patient has become the new payer. So if you don't have a plan to collect from the patient, you're missing out on a large opportunity here. So 33% of bill charges is going to be the responsibility of that patient. And Nick, that's, um, you know, that's like on the yearly basis, right? So that's just, you know, when you talk about the early start of a year, the patient responsibility is probably even higher than that. Um, you know, so this, this key of, of knowing that, that, you know, patients don't mind paying for something if they know upfront what it's going to be. They don't like paying for things when it comes in a bill later. And they didn't have any idea that they were going to get that bill. So, 
it's this transparency and and the fact that they you know get you can educate them on what they're going to owe is is really key. No, it's it's it's, it's powerful as well. But thank you, Michael. No. I would ask this, and, and I'm going to uh, expand on what, what Michael just said here on the next couple of slides, um, but I would ask this, you know, from an actionable item, you know, call it uh, the, the field version of what we're doing tonight, is to go back and, and find out from your staff, how much on a monthly basis are you writing off that's due to patient responsibility? If you can get so granular as, as DME, that, that write-off is your opportunity. That's the opportunity to increase collections by way of having a way of, of collecting upfront at time of service um, from your patients because they're a critical uh, portion of that responsibility. So the slide has moved on to, to Veripro and I hadn't yet used that word, but Veripro is a technology that we've developed that it's embedded into Motion MD, MD and would be available to you that allows you to ask, answer the age old question of how much does that cost? So patients, are getting DME, they're, they're, they're getting turned over in a room really quick, right? They're learning about their injury and what they have to do to, to main, you know, obtain the brace that they've just received, et cetera. They're pretty often asking like, what is this gonna cost me? And the conversation can go a couple of different ways. And pretty typically what we see is that um, either that there's a hesitation, uh, there's not very clear information on it. And, you know, whoever's dispensing that product to the patient is saying, look, You'll find out, like you'll get a bill for that. You know, it's based on your insurance. It should cover it, yada, yada, yada. Like move on, like we don't wanna talk about this right now. The other option is the practice might take some collection up front, whether it's a percentage of, of the cost of the product or the per percentage of Medicare allowable. Either way, it's a percentage, it's an estimate. It's not accurate. It's not ultimately what they will precisely owe, but we now have a technology that takes into consideration the DME benefits, whether or not a patient's met their deductible coinsurance, what their out-of-pocket max is, and we compare that to your contracted rates with the payers and determine at the time of service when the patient's receiving it exactly what they owe. So if I receive a reaction knee brace, a DJO product, I'm gonna know that you know based on my Anthem insurance and the fact that I haven't met my deductible that I owe $136.21. It's with that specificity that you would be able to have that conversation with the patient and therefore make efforts to collect from that patient. So two things are happening. One is you're drastically affecting your AR by having a conversation and allowing the practice to collect from the patient at the time of service reducing the amount of time it takes to make any collections, improving the amount of collections, and then having an honest conversation with the patient that they deserve about the product that they're receiving. Um, so if you'll move to the next slide. There you go. Um, there's a couple of facts that we've already talked about, the 33% of the bill charges being the patient responsibility. I'm gonna skip to the third fact on that, uh, that slide where it says, 95% of the time patients pay in full. So um, this is true, really cool. Maybe the, the coolest thing that we found out since we've introduced the product that we have, but when the patient knows exactly what they owe and why they owe it, and they're told up front with confidence, they're paying pretty much all the time. I think that's what you know 95% says. And it's, it's a really powerful way of making a connection with that customer who is essentially terrified about what that cost may be. So having that conversation up front is critical. Um, the, the bullet point in the middle there where it says $75 equals what a patient owes for a walking boot is, a, is just a literal and, and hopefully a real example for you. So in, in your space of sports medicine, you know, walking boots are pretty common occurrence. And it's another question to go back and ask the staff. It's, you know, if the patient hasn't met their deductible and they still have responsibility financially, are you collecting $75 for a walking boot? And it's just a, a worthwhile question to go back and, and find out because if you're not, then there's a tremendous opportunity and also a tremendous amount of money walking out the door when the patient leaves. Um, the rest of this slide, if you look at the bottom left, is really trying to tell you where that patient responsibility um, 
comes into play over the course of the year. From January, it's gonna be worse than December because patients haven't met their deductible. So in the beginning of the year, it's 46, like 47, my screen isn't wide enough here, 46 or 47% of the overall collection opportunity is gonna to have to come from the patient in the first couple of months of the year. At the end of the year, at best, 25%. And if you think about, you know, your payer mix, 25% could be Cigna or Aetna. So if you didn't have a, a, a good, clean, easy way to collect from Cigna or Aetna, then why would you not develop a good, clean, and easy way to collect from the patient? So it's just, I hope, hope I'd made too much of a, a, an effort to, to make that point, but the, finding a way to communicate the patient responsibility is going to be critical. And then I'll, I'll end with uh, this and, and one more slide here. I said it earlier, but you have an option in providing BME to your patients. It's got a very clinical need, but from a fiscal responsibility, we, um, we just want to partner with you one way or another. We have the ability to be agnostic in the solution. If you view DME as a cost burden, something that is a requirement to to, uh, to give to your patients, and that's something that we can help you with. But if you're looking to create an ancillary revenue stream, then by all means, it's, it's an opportunity with the tools and the team that we have to, to provide um, training to, to help you with. So, Natasha. Hey, if one quick uh, question for the, both of you, uh, coming again from the chat. Um, Matthew, th their clinic doesn't have a DME license. So they charge the patient, you know, what the, the cost of the product is, and then allow the patient to, uh, you know, submit to their insurance. Uh, and the question is, are there any tips in helping the patient get reimbursed? I, I didn't have an answer. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go off mute. So um, I, I'm, I'm based in California. Uh, Nick is based in Dallas. And in California, I'm seeing a, a good deal amount of uh, clinics or groups that are moving to that all cash pay model. And it's really because of that. They don't want to deal with the patient's insurance. So they're going to give the patient the documentation. The documentation is going to differ depending on the product that's prescribed, the payer, there may be, you know, certain criteria that need to be met. So it's really difficult to answer that with a blanket kind of general answer. Um, but there are definitely ways to do it. I would just say, you know, you're there there is definitely a way to circumvent this opportunity to see if you are leaving money on the table. Are there options to do things um, that could create a revenue stream or ancillary revenue where you don't have to basically offset everything? Is that something that you would consider? So whomever it was on the chat, if at the end when we share contact information, feel free to reach out to either Nick or myself. I'd love to work on a custom solution for your clinic that will address what it is that you're trying to accomplish with your DME needs um, and get you a roadmap to get to your end goal, so. Yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, for, for people that don't have a DME license, it's not difficult to get a DME license. It's, it's effectively some paperwork. Um, the, the, the real issue is the, the contracts with the insurance companies. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of where the, you know, the gap kind of comes, but, uh, you know, there, yeah. you're, you're a provider, uh, and in some cases your contract as a provider may have DME in it, or it may not. And, and again, that's where Natasha and Nick and this DJOHS uh, group comes in and helps look at those opportunities to say, yeah, you're, you're contracted for your clinical work, but not for DME or it's included. So it's, it's, it's actually looking at the, the entire aspect of it. Um, but that's where they, their expertise comes from. And they're in clinics across the country on a daily basis doing this. So their, their experience and expertise is, is very high. Um, one thing I'll add also is that it, if we're talking about this certain sp situation and maybe you have patients coming back to you that are maybe upset that they have to now deal with the whole circus of dealing with the, pay the payer and they want, maybe you're getting a lot of feedback from your patient population that they're really not liking this layout. You always have the opportunity to run a stock and bill um, and have all of this offset and have DJO bill for it. And you still have the continuity of care by having the products on your shelves and you don't have to bear the burden.
burden of billing those insurance payers. So like I said earlier, we customize solutions based on what you're trying to accomplish with DME, what kind of parameters you have set in place and what you're able to kind of get your arms around. Um, so we can talk about this offline, but there are definitely options for you. Yeah, no, that's perfect, Natasha. I mean, yeah, I think we need a little bit more specificity in your situation to be able to answer that, you know, to its fullest extent. But certainly you've, you've got a ton of options when it comes to that, um, which is a decent segue to the very last slide for tonight, I promise, um, which is to, to kind of help round out the idea of what it is that, that we could do to potentially help you. Um, and it's, you know, specifically the slide says the process consulting and implementation, but if you've, you've thought that, Hey, look, I get the, that there's an opportunity here, but, but what does it look like? What would the next steps be? Um, it is with our team. And, and I, I don't know if Natasha said it earlier or not, but like we're in a, a sales and consulting role and we've got tons of experience within the DME world, but there's a much, much bigger team of implementation specialists and billing experts and all these people who we use as subject matter experts to help you go from point A to point B. And what that looks like is we would help you evaluate what your opportunity is, identify what you're looking to accomplish, then help you design that plan. And then on site, hand in hand, work with you to train your staff um, to implement the, you know, the appropriate processes uh, the, the automation tools, if it's motion B that you're moving forward with. And then afterwards, look for the, for the lifetime of, of working with you in, in any circumstance, we want to meet on a regular cadence through business reviews to just make sure that your needs are being met, that the goals that you've set aside for your program are being met. And through these, you know, quarterly business reviews, you know, we're, we're identifying new challenges and new things that we can help you work with. So, um, with that, I, uh, I, I hope we've provided some valuable information to you tonight and, and, uh, let us know if you have any more questions. We've got some time. Um, I do see one more question, um, in the chat and it says, how are DGO and these programs helping compete with suppliers such as Amazon? Pa patients are becoming more savvy and learning what type of DME they need and then finding it much cheaper than many DME suppliers, including physicians offices. So Nick, not sure. Do you want me to take care? Do you want to take it? <laughs> I'm happy, go for, I'm happy, go for happy it. to address it. <laughs> so go, go for it. We did a presentation on this recently. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, the era of Amazon is upon us. I mean, I think there, we can't pretend that it doesn't exist, but I think also, along with everything else, there's some education that goes um, along with that conversation. So it's educating the patient, that there is a difference between getting something on Amazon and getting something in your office. There is a level of um, patient fitting, patient education that extends well beyond the brace that they don't receive at Amazon. I mean, I would have them say, look, if you were looking to cut costs somewhere, I'd maybe look at buying your Q-tips on Amazon, but not necessarily your knee brace. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's always going to be somebody cheaper and better, but to be honest with you, depending on what time of the year it is, if it's closer to the end of the year and they've met their deductible, oftentimes what their portion of their copay is is going to be less than what they find on Amazon. So it's really ha being able to utilize the tools that you have within MotionMD and within DJO to to educate the patient on that. And it goes to everything that we've said this entire time, which is education data is power. It's key. It's king. So if you have a, a method to be able to pull the patient's deductible and say, look, you've met your deductible, your out of pocket's going to be $26 for your reaction knee brace. Um, you think you can get it online cheaper. The fact is they're not going to be able to, and then they don't have the level of expertise that they get at the clinics. You know, that's a very transparent conversation that you can have today that you weren't able to have a year ago. Dang it. I was going to add stuff, but you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, that was perfect. Well, and, and we do know that uh, Amazon's a customer of ours. They do buy stuff from us. So we, we actually know what those costs are that, uh, that they're purchasing it for. So they're, they're certainly not getting that an incredible deal from us because, you know, we don't want the marketplace to be destroyed either. So um but they're hard to beat when it comes to getting it next day. But uh, then to Natasha's point, they put, you know, an ankle brace on their head. Uh, it's not real effective. So 
we do think right. there's some real value for the, again, this physician, patient, and supplier yeah. relationship. Um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the piece that we think is, uh, is most important. They're, I mean, they're coming into the clinic because they have a pain of some sort. So they want to address the pain. Is it worth, you know, saving the $5 and not applying the brace correctly and then compromising your outcome? Probably not. But again, I think what's most important is not being afraid of meeting that conversation head on and knowing that you have the tools to support what you're saying. Well done, so, guys. Yeah, I don't think we have any more questions right now, Michael. I, I don't know the, to close it. No, no. So the, the, you know, kind of the chat session looks like it's uh, quieting down. I mean, it's, it's a little later on the East Coast. Um, I have yet to have a, a glass of wine or anything um, here. Um, it is spring break, by the way. My, my wife is a first grade teacher, um, and she is very much deserving of a spring break. I, I cannot tell you uh, this last year, having her try to teach first graders remotely, you know, this thing kind of works for us. It, it works efficiently and beneficial to, to do these kinds of things. But first graders, um, so my wife is back in the classroom, and uh, so we're, we're going to take a, the rest of the week and try to uh, get her uh, charged back up. <laughs> As you should. <laughs> and uh, to Dr. McDonald, who was very participatory in the chat session, um, you can go ahead and email nick.cannon at DJO Global for a picture of Michael McBrayer. <laughs> I already sent it to him. <laughs> and, for, and for anyone else on the, I know there was a question about some cost of, of Motion MD and how it works. Um, for anyone on the call that would like some additional information about the software and how to implement it in your clinic, again, both of our contact information is at the bottom. So please feel free to reach out to us. We're here to help. Yeah. So the, the last question in here, and I think uh, we can reach back uh, just for everybody's time. Um, Hector Lopez was, um, you know, asking what the cost of a, um, you know, a Motion MD program looks like. So, right. Hector, I think uh, just just send a note to to Natasha, um, and we'll uh, we'll follow up. I mean, it, it, there's, it, it's not a simple answer. I'm just saying it's X because it's it's based on you know a lot of the size of your practice. There's a lot of things that go into it. So rather than making a, a simple answer that uh, really doesn't answer everything, um, you know, just reach out. Um, and one last uh, note that came through the chat is uh, about discounts for physicians who work in underdeserved populations and patients can't afford copays. So we do uh, have a robust financial hardship program um, that we offer as part of our um, office care or stock and bill scenarios. So there's definitely an answer to everything. I mean, we're, like we said earlier, we're a global company. And when it comes to stock and bills, we operate in um, the entire country. I personally cover 17 states and within those states, there are many under um, deserved populations or rural areas that we operate just fine. So if you, know, you wanna reach out to either Nick or myself after this call, we're happy to walk you through the specific details about your clinic and make sure that we create a program that works for you. All right, I think uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, Natasha, Nick, thank you very much. I, I, you know, obviously, uh, without the two of you, this would not have uh, been as educational. You know, I'm in here for you know, the entertainment, I guess, for <laughs> for the group. Um, I, I am certainly looking forward to getting back. Uh, the, the AMSSM is, a, is an important organization for us. We we support the traveling fellowship. We We've engaged in, you know, as, as a big sponsor to the organization. It's one of the fastest growing segments in medicine and very well needed in, in the market. So, um, again, thank you guys for uh, engaging with us. And we look forward to doing this live and in person in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, guys.